Okay, so I guess we'll get started. Thanks everybody um, for attending. This is the automotive grade Linux, uh, birds of a feather, developer birds of a feather session. And um, so all the, I, so I posted these slides maybe uh, an hour or two ago to the uh, schedule site so you can download them. There's a lot of links and resources at the end. Uh, so you don't, you can just click on them. They should all be hyperlinked. So I just wanted to do a quick introduction and then we can get into a more of a Q&A session. Um, what is AGL? In case you don't know, we're basically uh, an open source project hosted under the Linux Foundation. And our tagline is collaborating to build the car of the future through rapid innovation. We, um, we're focused on rapid innovation of, of in-vehicle software and that includes uh, instrument cluster and in-vehicle infotainment and telematics. And we're focusing on a single code base called the unified code base. So everything that we do is built uh, from a single uh, source tree. We have a total of nine OEMs that are supporting AGL. You can see we have Honda, most of the, uh, the Japanese ecosystem, including Honda, Suzuki, Subaru, Mazda, Toyota, uh, and Mitsubishi, plus um, uh, Mercedes-Benz and Volkswagen and Hyundai. And um, I was told that I could announce today that we now have 10 OEMs as part of AGL. Uh, Ford has officially signed the paperwork. They are now uh, silver members of AGL. So we have almost 150 member companies. And um, you can see we're split up into platinum, gold, silver, and bronze levels. Oops, what did I do? Um, AGL, Automotive Grade Linux, we're the only organization, like I said, that's addressing, really trying to address all of the uh, software in a car that run, might run Linux. And our tagline, one of, our, one of the things that we like to say is, if there's something, is there, if there's a computer in the car or there's a processor in the car running Linux, it should be running Automotive Grade Linux. And we've already got uh, device profiles and some reference, uh, reference devices and applications for uh, infotainment, instrument cluster, telematics. Uh, uh, Sand Cloud is working on a head-up display. Um, and we're, we're working towards, eventually, uh, advanced driver systems and uh, autonomous driving. And we're working with Elisa and uh, some of the hypervisor vendors to, on, on a functional safety solution. And our, we also announced, I guess, with a press release, although it's been running for a while, we have an instrument cluster expert group. Uh, Haraki-san from Suzuki, who's over there, he, he heads up that, that expert group. And that uh, was part of the press release we made today about um, um, both, Ford wasn't in the press release, uh, we, there was two, <laughs> the paperwork was signed too late for the press release, but we made a press release about the uh, Happy Halibut release that was just made, 8.0, and uh, the Instrument Cluster Expert Group being formed. So we've done uh, eight releases now of AGL, and they're named after fish. So uh, the Happy Halibut release was the eighth release, and coming up, we release about, uh, we, well, we have a major release twice a year, about every six months. And the next one will be Itchy Ice Fish. Uh, I don't know if I have pictures of the fish here. So <laughs> we started developing a single code base called the Unified Code Base. We started this effort in 2015. Uh, basically, for all of these different reference devices, we're creating, we're, we're working on the same Git tree. Um, and we're cultivating an ecosystem of developers and automotive suppliers and OEMs and expertise, all using a single software platform. And that software platform is uh, all running on uh, multiple boards. We have uh, six or seven different boards that we support. And if you uh, came by uh, yesterday to the tech showcase, you would have seen the IVI system running on an Intel upsquared board and the instrument cluster was running on a Raspberry Pi 3. So, but those are also, we have those also running our, our typical big green machine, if you've ever seen it, 
uh, at one of the shows, runs on a, a Renaissance R-Car M3 for the IVI system and a Intel a middle board max for the instrument cluster. So that's our schedule. Like I said, we have, um, we just released 8.0. Uh, we also just made a patch release for Happy Halibut at the end of July 703. So you can see we typically do two releases, two major releases a year, and we do patch releases uh, for, at least, for at least the next six months after that. Typically we've done uh, four to five patch, patch releases after the initial update. Um, we're planning another uh, uh, Guppy release in uh, September, and we're planning the first uh, Happy Halibut patch release in early September as well. So the AGL architecture, at a high level, it's, uh, it's, a mi it's microservices based. We've got, security, we've got security baked in using SMAC. Um, we've got this, this binding binder concept where the APIs are all, an individual API is a binding and then they're, all of the APIs collected for a specific service are in a binder. Um, it'll run on multi ECUs and in fact, uh, IoT.bzh in France is working on a port of the APIs and the, binding, the binders to Zephyr so we would like to be able to show that we can run uh, the APIs ac across different architectures. So like I said, the, this is more, more examples. We've got an, a documentation site with more information about these uh, bindings and binders as well. Um, <clears throat> it basically provides a standardized transport and integration method for all of the APIs. Um, available binders and bindings include uh, all these on this list. In fact, I may, I probably missed a few because we're always adding more. Um, but these are, these are the major ones, including home screen, window manager, audio, a bunch for connectivity, location, uh, media player, and uh, signal composer is what we use for CAN and for uh, auto for vehicle buses. We're also planning to use that same signal composer for uh, adding sensors for uh, ADAS or for autom automated automotive autonomous driving systems. We have an SDK, so a lot of everything that we're doing is based on Yocto. We're currently on Yocto 2.6, which is uh, Thor, Thud, Thor, Thor would be better, Thud. <laughs> Um, and what we wanted is our, our application developers to not need to know anything about Yocto. So we created this SDK. Um, you get, we, have H, we have both Qt apps and HTML5 apps available now. We have a web app manager that's available for HTML5 that was ported from WebOS open source edition. Uh, that was done by a combination of LG and Egalia. And before we get to the Q&A part, uh, developer resources. So I just listed a bunch of uh, resources you can click on. These are all hyperlinked in the, in the presentation uh, where our documentation site is. There's a good uh, getting started guide. There's actually one on our wiki page as well and it's linked from the wiki page. There's a good getting started guide as well on the documentation site. We use JIRA for our defect tracking as well as project management. Um, we have, for all of the releases, we have pre-built binaries and source tarballs available. If you don't want to go download the code, you can download one of those. Um, build instructions, release notes are available on the wiki. And we use Garrett for code review, and we use, uh, of course, Git for, for, code, for source code management. And in terms of if you have any questions, we have a weekly developer call on Tuesdays. We get about 30 to 35 people who call in. Uh, if there's something you're having trouble with and you need some help, uh, feel free to pop in on the call and it lasts about an hour on Tuesday mornings, uh, US time. But we get people who call in from Japan as well as Europe. Uh, we have an IRC channel. Um, we have a weekly newsletter that I've kind of not done for a few weeks because I've been on vacation and we have a, a very active mailing list. And then finally, we, we like to get together, have developers meet face-to-face, -to -face, and we organize about every two months a face-to-face -face meeting 
Uh, we, we've, we typically get 20 to 40 developers at these meetings working on, uh, we have a, uh, an agenda, sometimes it's a hack fest, sometimes it's more of a architecture discussion, but there's always a variety of topics that are listed that usually last uh, two to three days. The next one is scheduled next month in Berlin at uh, VW's site in, um, in, Ber in Berlin at the Carmec facility. And then you can see we have uh, two all-member meetings a year. The next one is coming up in October in Monte Carlo. And then finally, members can participate in our CES booth. Um, and we'll have a couple integration sessions for people who are working on uh, CES stuff that they might need help with integration on. So because it's a BOF session, mostly I wanted it to be dedicated to Q&A. So, um, I'll open up the floor to, to questions and I'll hopefully, we have some guys who are here in the front uh, or spread throughout the audience who work on the code as well. So anything I don't know anything, anything I don't know about, I'll make one of them answer. <laughs> so any questions? So the question was, is there a recommended configuration for getting started? Are you talking about, I mean, hardware configuration? Yeah. Well, you can use, I would say the, probably the easiest way to get, get there's a QMU, um, Q, Q, Kimu, QMU um, builds that we do. That's probably the easiest way to get, get started. Uh, if you wanted to get started on actual hardware, uh, we we most of the development's been, most of the developers and testing are working on the Renaissance Arcar M3. Uh, because that's what our, our green machine demo has been using. Um, but I know a lot of people like using the middle board or the up square board from Intel. Um, and the green machine itself is switching to the H3 board this year. Um, we've also got Raspberry Pi support, although that's Raspberry Pi kind of runs out of memory really quickly. Um, what did I miss? Oh, uh, we've got IMX6 support as well but that's not officially through NXP. We're kind of doing that on our own. U-boot, we're using, the question was what, what, what bootloader we're using. We're generally using U-boot. Um, it's everything's based on Yocto and um, oh, I, I forgot, recently uh, SandCloud ad, added support for their uh, BeagleBone enhanced board. Um, we've also got the, the, the BeagleBone Max in there, um, BeagleBone Black rather. Um, and I think most companies have found it pretty easy to, if they, have a, if they have a Yocto BSP layer, pretty easy to slide it into AGL and get it building. Yeah, if you're gonna do uh, the IVI side, you pretty much need to support Wayland and Weston. So if you have a BSP layer for a board that gets you pretty much up to date uh, Weston support, you should be able to just stick that in and, and build uh, there's, I think, instructions now. If not the mailing list, you can just ask, and it's relatively straightforward. I did the IMX61 in a couple days, uh, uh, like a month ago, so it's pretty straightforward for anything that has a, like a relatively good Yocto BSP layer. Yeah. Can you, can, maybe you could use the, the mic, I can't. No, no, don't shout, because it, it, it's being recorded, so I'll have to repeat it anyway. Yeah, so, so you mentioned a couple of uh, companies that are actively participating in the project, and like uh, I assume that at this time there are no active deployment like in any car. No, that's not true. So All right. starting in the model year 2018, that the was in the uh, Toyota Camry, and it's now gone into more of the Toyota line, some early versions of AGL. Uh, now it'll be going into some Mazda cars and um, Subaru cars. Um, and hopefully, you know, Suzuki's working on an instrument cluster, so it'll be getting in there pretty quickly. Um, so it's, it's actually been, act so some of the, uh, the members have been actively deploying it into their vehicles now. But what kind so of product? Dan, Dan, our, Dan Kaushi, our executive director, can...
Yeah, the, we, had, we, had our, we had a RAV4 at the, yeah, the Mercedes vans. We had a RAV4 at the CES booth last year. And what product are we talking about? The infotainment systems or some? The, cur the, the initial deployments have been infotainment systems. Now, uh, starting with uh, Happy Halibut or with or Grumpy Guppy, I think it was rather, we, we now have an instrument cluster reference device that you can build as well as a telematics reference device. And uh, there's been a lot of interest from a lot of OEMs on instrument cluster. Um, so our we have an instrument cluster expert group that meets every two weeks. And um, there have been, we've, we're actually driving a lot of the requirements into AGL now. And uh, Suzuki, uh, Haraki-san from Suzuki has been leading that effort. I actually have millions of questions, but I'll hold, anybody want to ask something? Because. All right, so I'll, I'll <laughs> proceed with another one. I mean, uh, just because it's interesting, like speaking of like the IVI, uh, how would you like compare the AGL against other things like uh, the Genevi uh, projects? And well, well, Gen well, so Genevi, we, we're, we have a single code base. Everything that we do is, is, is open and transparent. You can go to our website, uh, our wiki page rather, and see everything that we're doing, see all of our meeting minutes. You can go to our JIRA page, see all the defects. Everything I do is completely open. Jira, uh, Genevi does not have a single code base. They have different, different companies bring their own code base and they, cl they, 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 they claim somehow they're Genevi compliant. If you want to know what Genevi compliance means, well, you need to be a Genevi member. So it's not transparent. Um, so Genevi really is not an open, to my, to my, my mind, they're not an open source organization. They're not, they're not really open and transparent like we are. But there are some working groups that, um But there's no single, but BMW might have their own version, and Wind River has their version, and Mentor Graphics has their version. So you can download, you can go to our source tree and download the source code, and that is AGL. There's no debating, like, is it a Bosch version, a Mentor version? Genevi compliance is kind of nebulous, whereas everybody, if you, have a, if you have a patch or you have something you want to submit to AGL, you can submit, you know what, a lot of people will come to me and say, well, why aren't you doing so and so? Why aren't you? Why don't you have um, a, a full up can um, uh, uh, message ch messages from from the automotive makers? And basically, I say to them, look, we're an open source project. If somebody is interested in doing that, um, they'll bring it in. And I, I, Leon's a great example. Leon was really interested in the Raspberry Pi and even the Raspberry Pi four recently. So he brought he brought it he brought it in. Um, Geneva tends to be more top down and you know being driven by their um, executive committee or whatever they call it. Um, whereas we're basically, if you have something and you want to bring it in and it's a good idea, we review it, we'll accept it, and then we'll, we'll maintain that. Okay, so I'll proceed. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I don't work for Geneva. I did some help to some companies there. It doesn't really matter. Um, but there is a lot of like, Obviously, there is a lot of interest in combining several operating systems, and there is a lot of like work uh, of several SOC manufacturers on providing hypervisors mm -hmm. to ele to enable to actually combine them. Usually, it's go they're going to be QNX in something, and usually there's going to be interest of QNX plus Android or stuff like that. Now, in Geneva in particular, they have some interesting project that have to do with how to deal with the dual oh yeah by the way they oh yeah by the way they stole our white paper so okay. Geneva did so we we I don't know and I honestly don't care no no I'm just gonna tell you I'm just gonna tell you what, what, what we've done so last year we published a white paper we had uh, we have a virtualization <laughs> expert group I don't know what that is we have a virtualization expert group um, that has had has participation from a number of the hypervisor companies uh, as well as interested parties so last year uh, in uh, June, we released uh, a, a virtualization white paper, which kind of laid out the AGL uh, virtualized architecture. And you can go download that. I, I think if you go to our wiki page, you can find the link to it. I, sh I, I, can, I should have put it on here. 
Um, and then when Geneva started their, their new hypervisor group, one of the first things they did was they took our white paper and they dumped it into their wiki. Um, <laughs> so they actually took some prelim a preliminary version of it. Uh, so yeah, so Geneva, yeah, Geneva's working on that stuff, but they're late to the party. Um, and right now, so the hypervisor group is now focusing, we've been working with the, the Zen project uh, very closely with Lars and with EPAM. Their EPAM is a member and they, we've had a number of demonstrations running both Zen, uh, L4, and other, and other, and other hypervisors. Um, people showing both, uh, in Suzuki for example at the ALS Automotive Linux Summit was showing uh, more of a safety solution using a hypervisor where they could, they could, uh, they had isolated the safety critical parts. And then other companies are showing AGL running in one, one virtual machine and uh, another operating system running in a second virtual machine. So we, we've got a bunch of different people who've done hypervisor solutions for AGL. Okay. Yeah. Did you win? Empty handed. Womp womp. But like all, all, all the all like uh, the work and like the joint work are like organizations that have their representatives and there is some direction by the AGL project, right? I mean, you don't uh, go ahead and like start a workforce and like a funded project to do, I don't know, virtualization. So we, we play protocol. okay, so we do have funded. So if you go back to, if we go back to this slide, um, whoops. Ford. Um, so if you go back to this slide, the platinum, gold, and silver members contribute a significant amount of money to AGL every year. And we take a, a big chunk of that money, a significant percentage of that money, we take and we plow back into developers. So I manage about six different contractors who are actively working on code for AGL. Now, what's top down is the advisory board sets the priorities for what we're going, what, what, what we're going to have those developers go work on. The virtualization stuff, we have not funded anything. Um, the, the advisory board has not funded anything. So all of the work that's been done for virtualization has been done by companies on their own and by some individuals on their own. So we have the L4 support that's available out of the box or the KVM support, rather not L4, the KVM support that's available out of the box for Renaissance that was contributed by somebody, I can't even remember who. <laughs> um, but a, a lot of, the, all of the hypervisor work that you see done by people has been done by companies on their own. And most of it has not been contributed back to AGL. So like. What? Are the, what on virtualization, but I, I, I will say that every time I go to one of these shows, and this one has not been an example, has been an example, has, has, this one has not been an exception. Every time I go to a show or a conference, somebody comes up to me and says, hey, we're using AGL to do this. I, didn't, I had no idea. So um, yesterday, last night at the tech presentation, I had at least two different companies who said, oh yeah, we're using AGL. They're not members. They're just poking around. They're, they've actually got some stuff running. In one case, it was a virtualization company. In one case, it was a, a company doing some uh, package management type stuff. So, um, yeah, so it's a combination. We are, we are funding developers, um, including Scott consult from Consolco, Scott and Leon from Consolco to do some work. Um, and then some of it is just people contributing. Uh, either their own companies are funding it or individuals. Do you have like an active project that like run Android side by side with uh No, we do not. This is something that is like on the agenda, on the road? No, it's not. Completely not. We, we, we would not be able to do that. The Linux Foundation would not be able to sign agreements with Google to, to do that. So w there are companies that have done that, again, on their own. And I've seen them running at, uh, at trade shows, but uh, the, we are not going to do that. What, what I would like to see is, and what I've asked our companies to do who have agreements with Apple for CarPlay and Android for Android Auto, is to um, at least verify that they can run it on AGL, and then if there's any gaps, give us the uh, gaps in the enablers, then um, um, upstream the, the fixes they need to do that. And so there's a, co a few companies that have been doing that. 
Yeah, so uh, we are one of the things that we're doing is helping some of the companies that do like a dashboard, IVR, stuff like that. Um, to we sell display protocol. So like one of I, I was thinking of of open sourcing like some of the things that this protocol has to do with like running Android because like a lot of our clients like really are interested in it. Mm -hmm. And like this like brought like a light bulb, but I'll, I'll just take it offline. Like uh, don't want like to push anything. Just curious because I'm learning about it. Yeah, I think there's a question behind you. Uh, you mentioned some of the work being done around uh, safety. I was just wondering, like, what the what the scope of work there is, and and so we're who's driving it. It sounds like kind of some of the <clears throat> so the way here. so there's 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 two paths right now. Um, we're if you're familiar with ISO two six two six two, we're targeting ASIL level B, um, and there's really two paths. We were we're supporting the Elisa project. And they've got some on, they've had uh, some very long standing ongoing work that started with OSADL. And we've been attending their meetings and trying to help, trying to work with them to figure out what their path is for certification. But I think they're several years down the road. The other path is, which I think is the more pragmatic and faster and, and probably better path for us is um, the, expert, the instrument cluster expert group, um, some of the companies that are working there will build, or they will basically build, they've started building an AGL-based instrument cluster, and as they work through what issues that they have, because you have to certify the whole device, you don't certify just the software. So as they work through what it, whatever they, as they work through their device and go to the certification authorities, they, they'll come back to us with a punch list of things that we might need to do in AGL to support them doing, uh, getting their, their, their device safety certified. So. I anticipate that effort will go much, much more quickly than the Elisa effort, um, and we should see some, some, some announcements from some of our member companies that they've uh, released devices that are safety certified um, using AGL in the next, in the next, hopefully, eighteen months. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so, so in my opinion. Um, these, these specifications like ISO 26262, um, they were created decades ago. And they were created at a time when code bases were, you know, counted in the thousands of lines of code. And the whole approach of, of those types of specifications are basically you build a system, you pour cement on it, and you never change it. And that kind of mentality is, is so backwards compared to how we develop software today. And in fact, if you talk to a guy like Greg KH, who maintains you know, Linux kernel and, and, uh, and uh, long-term support, he has data that shows that it actually benefits the platform when you apply patches, apply bug fixes, apply security fixes. The platform actually gets better over time, not worse. So this cement model has to stop. So my, my view is on longer term, we as an industry need to go to the authorities and say, hey, you have it backwards and you need to change the way you look at software because if you don't patch things, you end up with a vulnerable system. So I, I think the industry needs to get all together behind Elisa, behind AGL, and get them to change the way they think about functional safety certification. And I, and I think that's part of our agenda to push that, that concept along, al along with the Elisa project. So I was a little curious why, it's, it, I mean, as an outsider looking at some of the stuff in the project recently, the, the push for more of this like HTML5 support, that kind of stuff in there, which seems to kind of add to the, the bloat of the code base in some ways. It definitely adds to the, the, the complexity and the size, yeah. I, I'm just curious like what, what, where the real motivation is there, like is somebody really... To not use Qt. QT or whatever, but it just seems like if I'm designing instrument clusters or things like an, that. An instrument cluster wouldn't use it. Wouldn't use uh, HTML5. So, okay, so I'm just curious where the where the the. So this is again. Again, this is something that we we basically it's coming from our members. I, we don't do anything unless one of our members want, is interested in doing it. We're an open source project, so so yeah, this has come from uh, LG Web and, and the WebOS OSE community. 
they had a web app manager. There's been a lot of interest. For, certain companies are very interested in HTML5 for their IVI systems. Um, you know, the ability to do like a, a Spotify app or a, you know a more commercial app using a web app is really enticing. Um, and also, there's not a good, right now there's not a good open source alternative to Qt. So um, if you want to show something that's not using Qt, it's a it's a good quick and dirty uh, uh, way to get there. It's using the web apps. So in response to the question about HTML5, the other reason why some places are interested in HTML5, not specifically in the automotive, but in the general display of control systems <clears throat> is because the external entities that they're communicating with are more and more commonly generating HTML5 output that you can then insert into your UI. So for instance, if you have an engine, that engine may put out some very specific uh, metrics and tachometer, et cetera, in HTML5 that you can then embed into the user overall user interface. So your IVI, well not your, well your IVI may be getting this fr um, from your external entities, uh, or more importantly, your uh, uh, your infotainment center could be getting that from your IVI as a data source that you're then able to embed inside your display without having to manage that information itself. Um, yeah, one of the things is Agalia has done some some benchmarking on the M3 now, the Renaissance M3, and there's almost no performance difference between the HTML5 stuff that we have and the QML stuff. So um, I think a lot of that performance gap has been. It's big. It's big. Yeah. I don't think I see a vector up there, and I'm, I'm just curious, do you think that Autosar is, um, is a competitor to automotive grade Linux? I, I mean, I, I'm seriously trying to understand how far AGL will go, and do you see it like taking over more of the gateway modules? And so that's, a, actually, that was kind of the question I got yesterday during the tech showcase, and that's the question I was discussing about our members bringing something in. So I think we could do that, um, but so far, our OEM members have not shown an interest in doing that, which, which, which befuddles me, because you would, I would think that they would be looking for a way to eliminate, we'll call it the vector tax, right? They pay a huge amount of money to vector. Every car, every, every, not only every vehicle line, but every vehicle they want to do, they've got to redo the messages. Um, I would think that our members would be usually interested, our OEM members would be usually interested in pushing that. And so far, they've not been. The, the CAN stuff that we've done um, has largely been pushed by tier twos and tier ones, not by the OEMs. I cannot get, I've not been able to get an OEM to agree to give me uh, a message library. Mm -hmm. um, I've, Having worked for Motorola, Telematics, and, Con and Continental in the past, I know, you know, and being very familiar with some CAN requirements in terms of factory requirements and, you know, programmability of, of message libraries, I, I, I've tried to push some of those requirements into AGL. But the fact is, is um, I'm not willing to really fund those with our development money because if, the, if none of the OEMs are going to pick it up, it's, it's, not, it's not really worth our... Right, like and then I, I wanted to follow up. So I know you have CAN support, but what about like Linbus, Flexray? Lin, we have Lin there. Oh, cool. So we basically our, our HVAC app now runs Lin, and what you'll see coming up in our next version of our demo is uh, Suzuki has donated some steering wheels and the controllers, and we're adding a Lin controller for the steering wheel as well. So the steering the steering controls that go into the IVI system. So we've got we've got Lin support in there. We've got CAN. We've got most. Um, but I think um, I think for us to go to the next level with the with the can support to get to to get to that vector type, yeah, we right, need PC. we need the, that to be pushed by our OEM members. Yeah, it makes sense. All right, thanks. So regarding the autos are that question there, it's uh, the autos are consortium has something called adaptive autos are now. Is adaptive AutoZar is basically a set of libraries that is transporting all the AutoZar functionality on top of Linux there. 
So basically, this is a, be a concept of libraries that can be used for all AutoZAR applications. So the companies that still use in AutoZAR can actually reuse their applications without rewrite codes. Yeah, we'll see. Library. I don't know if I believe their story. Huh? I don't know if I believe their story. We'll see. Uh, the, mm, yes, I see it running on my machines in my development there. It's not, a, it's not, it's really going to the prototypings right now. So it's not an history, it's happening, it's official. Sorry, that's a, that's a reality. It's my project, a big project right now inside BMW for the for next year. So it's it's not a joke. Uh, I don't think it's a joke, but we'll, yeah. we'll see. Yeah, it's there already. Again, it's a closed system, so it... it Just autos are is closed. Yeah. It's just, autos are is not closed, it's, an, uh, it's depending on foundation, it's not a different thing. The, the, the completely specification is open. The specification, what about the code? Is that a yes or a no? Uh, no, the, the code, uh, the code, of course, each, each imp uh, implementation, they actually... So it's not, it's not open source. You can, you can be like, you can have an open spec, but without... And, it's, and the implementation code is open. Mm -hmm. It's coming from Adaptive Altar. If you want to do your implementation, that way, usually what vendors do, tier one and tier two, Actually, that's, that's, then it's proprietary. But then, if you have the implementation code as long as you're part of organization. It's basically the same idea you, you say that's about Genevieve. So, we'll see. Any other questions? I think our time is up, but... Anything else? Well, thank you, everybody. This was great. <laughs>